today's title is Yom Teruwa and the Mystery of the Rapture. It could actually also have been the Rapture and the Mystery of Yom Teruwa. And I will clarify that. And I hope you stick around until the end, because you will hear things that you have not heard elsewhere. A few days from now, it will be what many call Rosh Hashanah, but biblically it is actually Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. For most Christians, it is uh, meaningless and it goes actually unnoticed. For others, it is linked to the Rapture, and thus a very exciting time. And for most Jews, it's actually New Year and uh, therefore it's very festive. Uh, but what does the Bible tell us? That is what we want to know. And in order to find out, we first go to Leviticus 23, verses 24 and 25, where God declares this feast. And it says that, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing the trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. But you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And then in Numbers 29 verse 1, it says, And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. So what do we get from this? We get that it is a Sabbath, and no servile work should be done. It is a day of rest. We also learn that it's a memorial, and that trumpets are to be blown, and offerings to be made. But that raises as many questions uh, as it answers, because why is it kept? Of what is it a memorial? Why blow the trumpet? How many times to blow the trumpet? The Bible gives us no direct answers to these questions. And when we look at the biblical timeline, and uh, you can download this, uh, this uh, chart from uh, the website, I leave a download link in the description, and as all material there, it's for free, um, and these are great resources um, uh, for your Bible study. So please take advantage of that. But if we look at this, we can see that during the time that Moses was on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments for the second time, that um, uh, this was the, the time when um, the sixth month would go uh, end and the seventh month would begin, and therefore this, uh, this feast would actually take place. Uh, he would be on the mountain for 40 days, and um, this um, first day of the seventh month would be the, th the 30th day that he was on the mountain. So 10 days after that he would return. And meanwhile, uh, as he was on the mountain, the Israelites were seeking the Lord, um, hoping that he would forgive them, because of course before that the golden calf uh, event happened. And so this period of uh, these 30, or actually 40 days, um, are, are called um, the 40 days of repentance. And the first 30 days of these 40 days is the month Elul, the sixth month, uh, which is also called the month of repentance, of Teshuvah. And so on the 40th day, Moses returned. That is the day that we now know as Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Moses returned from the mountain, from the presence of God. And for ages after that, on that same calendar day, the priest, the high priest, returned out of the Holy of Holies. From the presence of God, he came back. And we expect on a future Day of Atonement, our high priest, our eternal high priest, as the book of Hebrews declares, Yeshua, to return from the presence of God at the end of the tribulation. So you can see already a pattern there. Now we will see many hints as to why Yom Teruah points to 
and may find its fulfillment in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. If we think of the Day of Atonement as uh, the return of Jesus uh, at the end of the tribulation, the second coming, then Yom Teruah is at the beginning of the tribulation period. And I will get to more uh, into detail uh, how this is so. Um, there are actually seven days in between Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur. And these obviously reflect then the um, 70th week of Daniel or the um, Jacob's trouble or the tribulation period. Note also that Yom Teruah is the first day of the seventh month. This means six months have been um, have passed. Uh, that reflects the 6,000 years since Adam. So when they are full, then all this takes place. Then we are at the end of the age. But there's still a lot of conjecture as to the meaning of the feast. Does it actually point to anything prophetic that is to be fulfilled? That is a legitimate question. Well, God tells us that these feasts are his appointed times, or divine appointments, Moadim, Leviticus 22. 23 verse 2, we spoke about this often in different videos. So it becomes clear when we see that Jesus' crucifixion, his death and his resurrection take place on feast days, days that have been declared by God ages before as special dates on his calendar. And of course also the Holy Spirit descends in tongues of fire on the, uh, on the disciples on the Feast of Weeks, on Shavuot that we now know as Pentecost. In any case that there would be any doubt, um, Paul connects the dots for us. He says specifically in um, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7, he says uh, in the second half of the verse, For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Jesus is our Passover. So he was not only crucified on the day of Passover, on the starting of the Feast of Passover, but he was our Passover. Um, he died for our sins, and leaven is sin. We read this also in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 6 and 7. Your glorying is not good, no, you're not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. And of course, Jesus makes the same connection also. So, but Jesus was in the grave during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And of course it has its origin in Exodus, and we did in Exodus 12, but we see again Jesus is fulfilling it by dying for our sins, taking away the sins, <coughs> the leaven, uh, and he was in the grave during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And um, Jesus also is the first fruits of the resurrection. That we can read in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. There it says, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. And he rose from the dead on the feast of first fruits. So he fulfilled the meaning of these feasts, but also on the dates, on the calendar days of these feasts. So we see clearly there is a pattern and we see clearly they are prophetic, divine appointments. And I already mentioned also, of course, the, the day of Pentecost and it happened on the Feast of Shavuot. Another fulfillment of, um, of the feast. So it would actually be silly not to expect, expect the same fulfillment in meaning and timing for the fall feasts. And Paul leaves no doubt about it. He writes about this event first to the Thessalonians, and that's in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 to 18. There he even emphasizes that there is no need for him to write concerning the times and the season. Why is there no need? Because they already know. Um, and then he reveals 
the whole mystery in his first epistle to the Corinthians. And maybe uh, it's uh, a bit upside down uh, or um, in reverse order in our minds, but we have to, um, to remember that the book, um, on the, the epistle to the Thessalonians was written prior to the epistles that were written to the Corinthians. There's a gap of about four years between, uh, between the Thessalonians and the Corinthians. So um, that's why I say after teaching and writing these things to the Thessalonians, then he reveals a full mystery to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. And I always call this, this especially this chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, and then of course the closing of the epistle, chapter 16. But this is really a bonus that he gives them because the first epistle to the Corinthians is, is criticism, is um, exposing their, their errors uh, and, and urging them to make change, to repent from this, which they, by the way, did, as we can read in the second uh, epistle to the Corinthians, which was written a year later. But uh, after all this, um, this criticism, you could say, uh, he comes with this positive note, with this note of hope and um, blessed expectation. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 and 52. It says there, Behold, I will show you a mystery. Now, stop right here. This is actually the most important of the whole section. Behold, I will show you a mystery. He is going to reveal something that until that time was a mystery. Even to the Thessalonians, to whom he wrote about the rapture already four or five years prior. Now he's going to reveal a mystery. That means after what he's going to say, it was clear to the readers of this epistle what the mystery was and how it was to be explained. That's something to keep in mind. I'll get back to that. He continues, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So he mentioned this trump of God already to the Thessalonians. He mentions it here again. But now he emphasizes, he says, for the trumpet shall sound. There's no doubt about that. It's going to happen. The trumpet is a very important um, element in this uh, mystery. And uh, when we read this as uh, modern day Westerners, we say, okay, so what mystery is now revealed? What is he actually saying? Uh, that um, question did not live in the minds of his contemporaries. And I will get to that, why that is so. This is key important. So the trumpet. What about the trumpet? The last trumpet he even mentions. It's apparently a very explicit sign. And many have speculated what it refers to. Now, again, Paul says, I will show you a mystery. I will, I will reveal a mystery to you. That means what he writes is clear to the recipients. It's revealing. It does not leave questions. And therefore we can conclude that he was not speaking of the judgment trumpets that were blown by the angels in the book of Revelation, as many believe the last trumpet is the seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation. No. Impossible. Because the book of Revelation was not written until more than 40 years later. And so this would not have made any sense to the Corinthians and would not have explained, revealed anything to them. It would only have left them with questions. Uh, and so it would still be a mystery to them. So that is absolutely not what he refers to. Now when we study the Bible, we find different purposes for blowing the trumpets. What we want to know is why the trumpet is blown on the Feast of Trumpets. Remember we read from Leviticus and Numbers that the trumpet has to be blown, but it doesn't say why. And also we want to know to what trumpet Paul is referring if he speaks of the last trump, or the last trumpet. 
We already established that he made the link between the prophetic events regarding Jesus and his bride and the feasts. He has done that even prior to this in the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, but also earlier in this epistle. And keep also in mind, this is one epistle, it's one letter he wrote, the whole letter, and then posted it, so to speak. Uh, so um, this comes as one message. So um, the Feast of Trumpets is the next to be, the next feast to be fulfilled. So based on that, it's already obvious to make the connection between the rapture and Yom Teruah. The rapture is the first great event to happen concerning Jesus and his bride. But let us quickly look at some uh, different occasions for blowing the trumpet, because um, there is also a lot of um, talk about all that. But the Bible speaks uh, of this in different occasions, and we will not read the verses, but I will just list them uh, for reference. Um, trumpets could be blown for signaling uh, war, uh, or for heralding the year of Jubilee. They were blown when a king was crowned, also to warn for danger. Also, to herald the coming of the Messiah. Trumpets were blown when the camp needed to be broken up. And they were blown accompanying the rituals done by priests. And there are some more uh, occasions. I will mention a few more later. So, there are many occasions when trumpets are blown. So, that actually doesn't answer our question, why are they blown in Yom Teruah? Is it any of these reasons or still something else? Um, furthermore, we need to delineate between trumpets and shofars or horns. Um, these are different things. In ancient times they were always shofars, um, but uh, during the temple era they began to, uh, to fabricate trumpets. Uh, there were silver trumpets that were used in the, the temple. And, um, that was, of course, also uh, the case uh, during Paul's time. So when Paul is writing, at that time in the temple, trumpets were blown, silver trumpets. And then there is also a delineation in scripture between the trumpets of men, the men blow, the trumpets of angels, like the judgment trumpets in, trumpets in the book of Revelation, they are blown by angels, and the trump of God that we read of here and in a few other places. And uh, then in the book of Revelation, there are even mentioned golden trumpets. These are the trumpets uh, in heaven. Now, the question remains, which trumpet was Paul referring to? Uh, how did the Corinthians understand this? Because we can be sure they understood what he was saying. He was revealing a mystery to them. So what we have to look at is what traditions were in place at the time. And this is always a bit tricky because we now move out of scripture to traditions. Um, and there is some conjecture, of course, there. But actually, if we, are, um, if we study uh, the New Testament in particular, um, then we see that actually we often have to do that to fully understand um, what is actually happening. Um, I've referred to these things many times. Uh, one example that comes to mind is um, when the Feast of Tabernacles is celebrated that there is this water libation and um, that uh, Jesus uh, stalls in going there but eventually he goes and he then stands in the temple square and shouts that he is the source of living water. Um, without knowing the tradition of water libation, um, that uh, you miss actually the, the, uh, the crux of this, uh, of this, what's happening there. So we have to uh, often refer to, um, to traditions in order to understand scripture the way that uh, the people in, in those days understood it. So what was the tradition in place uh, at the time? Um, 
during the Feast of Trumpets, there were actually three central themes of the feast. One was the crowning of the king, the other was the wedding of the Messiah, and the third one, the resurrection of the dead. And when I list these to you, then you would say they all have to do with Jesus, actually. And they all point to Jesus, to the bride and the rapture. Yet these were not invented by Christians. These were Hebrew uh, historical traditions. And all three, crowning, wedding and resurrection, are reasons to blow the trumpet. But what is the last trumpet? This question still remains. Well, the Corinthians and all Jewish people and Israelites would have known. There are three very important trumpets and I will mention them. One was the first trumpet. The first trumpet was sounded every year at the start of the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot or Pentecost. And that stems from Exodus 19, verse 19. This is when Moses um, will ascend the mountain for the first time to receive the Ten Commandments. It says there, and when the voice of the trumpet, and this is the trumpet of God, by the way, uh, when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And that is when Moses will go up to the, uh, on the mountain and God will come down and meet him. It's a type, of course, of the rapture also there. But um, that's the first trumpet. And so this is typically um, on the, um, this, at the start of the Feast of Weeks. Um, the first trumpet. Then there is the great trumpet, the Tekiah Hakadol. And this is sounded at the end of the Day of Atonement. Uh, and this um, heralds that the gate of heaven is now closed. So the gate of heaven opens at some point. I'll get to that in a minute. But at the, at, um, at the end of Yom Kippur, at the end of the Day of Atonement, the gate of heaven closes. And this um, finds its parallel in the story of the ten virgins, Matthew 25, when the door closes and they can no longer enter. And then there is the last trumpet. This is the one that Paul is referring to. That's the Tekia Gadola. And that is blown at the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets. The beginning of the Feast of Trumpets. Now the Feast of Trumpets, uh, uh, we read it just from, from uh, Leviticus and Numbers, it's a, it's a day of blowing the trumpets. It's not just one blow, it's a lot. So what they do at the, um, during the Feast of Trumpets, but specifically at the beginning, is they play a certain sequence of, uh, of notes. Um, I'm not going to explain all the details of that. We've done that before, but it's, it's not super relevant now. But a certain sequence of notes um, until 99 notes are played. And then follows the hundredth note. And that is an elongated note. It sounds as long as the blower can do it. And this is called the Tekiah Gedola, the last trumpet. It's the last of this sequence of a hundred. Um, and this is a sign of the opening of the gate of heaven. So when the Feast of Trumpet begins, in the, and remember that the Hebrew days begin at even, at the evening, at the sunset, when it begins, that is when this sequence is blown and at the hundredth note, it's the Tekiah Kedola, the last trumpet, long note, the gate of heaven now opens. So you have to imagine that we had this 40 days of repentance. This is to, to get right with God. And now um, at um, Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, the gate of heaven opens. Now there is access to God. And that lasts for 10 days. And at the 10th day, um, at Yom Kippur, at the end of the day, um, then the great trumpet is blown and the gate of heaven closes. So that is what it's all about. And that is exactly what Paul refers to. Everyone uh, in, in that time, in that culture, would have understood what he was talking about. He was talking about the trumpet 
that is blown at the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets at even. The gates of heaven open and that is when uh, first the, uh, when the dead in Christ rise and then those that remain in our life and are, belong to God, they will be taken up into heaven as it is now open. The open door is the other element in this um, mystery. But he reveals it. Yeah, I'll get back to this, this later again. So, there's an open door. It makes all perfect sense. The last trumpet, the gate of heaven opens, those resurrected and those who remain in our life enter heaven. And this idea was not new. What was new is that it was now linked to the last trumpet. He had not done this in his epistle to the Thessalonians. There he speaks that there is a trumpet, but he doesn't say that it is the last trumpet. And now he reveals that mystery. Now he connects the Feast of Trumpets to the event of the Rapture, whereas to the Thessalonians he had only revealed the event of the Rapture and its general timing in sense of the season. Now he gives it, um, he links it to the Feast. The, as I said, the idea was not new. We find a type of this event in the Temple traditions. And this is one of the traditions that is recorded in Scripture. In Ezekiel 46, verses 1 to th uh, through 3, there it says, Thus saith the Lord God, the gate of the inner court that looketh toward the east shall be shut the six working days, but on the Sabbath it shall be opened, and in the day of the new moon it shall be opened, and the prince shall enter by the way of the porch of that gate without, and he shall stand by the post of the gate. And the priest shall prepare his burnt offering and his peace offerings, and he shall worship at the threshold of the gate. Then he shall go forth, but the gate shall not be shut until the evening. Likewise, the people of the land shall worship at the door of this gate before the Lord in the Sabbaths and in the new moons. This is God speaking and God ordaining this um, procedure to be done. But we note a few things. This happens on the new moon. Now Yom Teruah, Feast of Trumpets, is the only feast of the seven feasts that God gives that happens on a new moon. So there is again a link there. Um, it also speaks here about six working days that the gate is closed and then on the Sabbath it shall be opened. Again, there is this 6,000 years, and then at the end of the age, before the seventh day, the seventh millennium begins, the gate opens. And uh, then it says, the prince, this is a very peculiar thing here, um, it says the prince will, um, will uh, stand by the post of the gate. Uh, he will not come out. He will stand there at the post of the gate. And this, of course, points to our Prince, the Prince of Peace, Jesus, the Lord of Lords, who will meet us in the air. He will stand in the porch, so to speak. He will meet us in the air and escort us into heaven, his bride. So there's a beautiful type here, and if you read this, in the book of Ezekiel, and you may wonder why does God ask the people and the priests to do this? What's the whole purpose? And who is this prince? What is it all about? But once you, um, you know what we know now, then it all makes perfect sense. The Jews also expected a resurrection, and actually they still do to this day. That too was not a new idea. And it was even assumed that a righteous man that would be alive during that, um, that time of resurrection would be partakers of that great event. Um, we read that in Isaiah, Isaiah 26, verse 19 and 20. There it says, Thy dead men shall live, here's the resurrection, together with my dead body shall they arise. Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection, and those that are his will follow. Awake and sing, you that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as the dew of the herbs. 
and the earth shall cast out, out the dead. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut the doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation, the tribulation is over, past. Uh, absolute parallel with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. And I'm saying again, he is um, revealing to the Corinthians a mystery. The mystery is not the resurrection, because it was already known. We just read it. Uh, it is not um, the taking up of heaven of uh, the living believers. It was known. We just read it from Isaiah. Uh, it is not that the trumpet of God will sound. He had already revealed it to the Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16. The real revelation is that he links it to the last trumpet, the Tekiya Kodola, thereby solving the mystery of why this Feast of Trumpet is kept and what it is actually commemorating. It's a memorial. God says it's a memorial, but he doesn't say of what, but now it's revealed. The mystery is revealed. It's a memorial of the biggest event to happen in the history of mankind. And um, God also said, as we read from Leviticus and from Numbers, that it is a, a solemn day, a Sabbath, with no servile work. Uh, unfortunately, most Jews today celebrate, actually, on that day, the secular New Year, which is called Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. And that is done with much noise and festivities. It's actually not like a Sabbath at all. And it totally overshadows the real meaning of Yom Teruah. So, um, we should not um, confuse these two. And I've done this also in the past. Uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Teruah, these are two different feasts. They are on the same day. They are both on the first day of the seventh month. Yom Teruah is the biblical feast, the Feast of Trumpets, as God ordains it in Leviticus 23 and in Numbers 29 and other places. Um, Rosh Hashanah is a secular new year. It, by the way, also has biblical significance. We uh, covered that in, in another message, or more than once actually. But um, nonetheless, they are different things. So it's not by chance that Yom Teruah is in the fall, at the time of the harvest. Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. We just read it from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. And so the rest of the harvest will follow. You have the first fruits and then you have the rest of the harvest. And in agri agriculture, the, you have the barley harvest and that is followed by the wheat harvest. And so the first harvest of the bride being taken uh, home before the tribulation will be followed by the second harvest of the wheat and of the gleaning, by the gleaning also. So the second harvest has to do with the people of God. It's Jacob's trouble, and the many will um, come to saving knowledge of Jesus during the tribulation, as we can read in Zechariah 12 and uh, Revelation chapter 12 as well. And so that is like the wheat harvest. And then there is, of course, the gleaning of the field, which refers to the tribulation saints. Now the barley was thrown in the air with a fork uh, and then the wind would separate the chaff uh, from the grain. And that reminds us of the rapture, when we meet Jesus in the air. Uh, however, the much harder shell of the grain, of the wheat, was uh, separated by uh, a threshing sledge. It was uh, covered with, uh, with pins or little stones. And so they were, the, the grains were hit so that the, this hard um, shell would come off. Um, and this uh, threshing sledge was called by the Romans during Jesus' days. It was called a tribulum. And this reminds us, of course, of the tribulation period. It's like uh, the remnant of of Israel uh, has to go through this tribulation, has to be under this um, threshing sledge to get this hard shell off. 
Um, that's the, like the second harvest, you can say. And uh, we know that um, from Zechariah 12, that in that day, when they shall look upon the one they pierced, there shall be great mourning. Now there is also a fruit harvest. Fruit harvest is uh, the, the treading of the, the grapes in the wine press. Uh, and that has everything to do with the wrath of God. That's what we read in Revelation chapter 14, the last part of this chapter. So I think we've learned quite a few things. We've learned that Yom Teruah is a prophetic date. And we've learned that it is linked to the rapture of the church, of the bride of Christ. Paul makes it clear on diff in different ways. First by showing a pattern of fulfillments of prophetic events and the feasts. And secondly, by connecting this particular event to the last trumpet. And we learned what this last trumpet is. So, have we arrived at the end of the age? Some doubt it. Some are convinced. I would say, look at the signs that Jesus mentions in Matthew 24, verses 4 through 12. These are end time signs. Another way to answer this question, have we arrived at the end of the age, is by saying, look at Israel. Jesus says, also in Matthew 24, look at the fig tree. At the fig tree. And in Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, it says, and all the trees around it, these are the nations surrounding it. Well, and look at Israel and the surrounding nations. And um, it's obvious. How much longer can it last? So I would say, yes, we have arrived at the end of the age. Will the rapture happen this year on Yom Teruah? I do not know. I do not know. Um, it makes sense, first of all, that it happens on Yom Teruah. And Yom Teruah, you don't have to go to difficult uh, and uh, obscure calendars and calculations. Just look at the moon. It's on a new moon uh, at the season of harvest. So it's uh, easy to determine. Um, it makes sense that it happens on, on Yom Teruah. Because that's the pattern that we have seen. Is it this year? Well, if you look at all the things around us in the world, then you would say, how much longer could it be? Could it be another year? Could it be more than that? It's hard to imagine. But uh, we don't know until it's so. The thing is that if it does, if it does, it should not overtake us by surprise. Jesus says in Luke uh, 21, Watch therefore, pray always, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. It doesn't say they may come to pass, or they could come to pass. No, they shall come to pass. And keep looking up. Our redemption draws near, very near. Amen. Amen.